Well, we're glad to be back. I'm excited for the fall. I'm excited for what this year is going to bring. It's been a, a huge time of transition and change that is before us, which I realize, and I know none of us loves change. Uh, well, some of us do, but um, not most of us do not. But it's going to be a great change, and I think God is going to be transitioning us and, and morphing us into uh, the next phase of, of our church, and I'm excited about that. And it's made me think a lot about the process of change. And that change always requires one thing, if nothing else, and that is endurance. That we have to be able to endure the hardship while we transition from one thing to another. And it's a very natural thing. If you, if you think about childbirth, if you think about adolescence, if you think about uh, growing food or, or harvesting food or hunting or, or anything that produces good things, there is a time of endurance that's required, a time of hardship, a time where we earn uh, that thing that we have, a time where we are, are planting and sowing and, and uh, de-weeding and, and doing all the things that are required, uh, going to school to gain education or, or getting work experience so that we can be uh, all we can be, that we can realize our potential. And that is, that is a truth of life, and that there is no escaping that uh, truth. There is no escaping change. There is no escaping growth. All we can do is try to reject it or try to stand against it. And of course, if it's a bad change, we should stand against it. But inevitably, that change is going to have an impact on us, and it, and it is our responsibility no one else's, our responsibility to respond in a correct way. So let's begin looking at this in Romans chapter 5. We're going to look at several passages in Romans. A great epistle, uh, an epistle that, that, has a lot, that talks a lot about doctrine. It talks a lot about the call uh, of the early church to action, to spread the gospel throughout the region and even to the ends of the earth. And in this epistle, we find some very important things as the church in Jerusalem faces a great time of change. Because uh, for, for them, they grew up as Jewish. And now, Jesus has kind of turned everything upside down. And that the way that they worship, the way that they're made right with God, many, many things have changed. And they are going to require a different type of life than what they've been living. A more missional and evangelistic life, to say the least. And a life of discipleship and a life of truth. And so, in the midst of this change and in the midst of, of this call, there are going to be a lot of, of families that are separated. There are going to be a lot of, of people who are sent out to go and to start these new churches all over the region. And there will be missionaries such as Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and others and John Mark who are kind of going around to all these different churches and, and, and they're trying to get, get things going and, and help establish leaders in that area. And, and that is the work of the church. That is the work that Christ left us. And in fact, as, as the Western Americanized church, we are really in the exact same situation that the New Testament church was in. But no longer do we have the luxury of a cultural standard of Christianity. That ended probably about 20 years ago, give or take. And now we are in a place where, where Christianity is declining, and there is now this separation between all the people who have faked it for the last 50 to 70 years and who have kind of pretended just to go with the flow to be with the in crowd that they're Christians. And now you have this separation of the, the few who are faithful who remain that were really serious about following Jesus. And it has, it has spelled a, a very difficult time for churches. And now it is, it is a time of change where we have to, to embrace a new way of doing church. We have to embrace a new way of being missional, of reaching the lost, of making a difference in our community, a, a, new, a new life that is outwardly focused rather than inwardly focused. See, when the church thrives and, and when Christianity becomes the prevalent cultural belief system throughout history, what usually happens is all the externally focused missional objectives that were out there, even as early as the first century church, they began to turn inward. And we began to focus on, on comforts for us. Nice chairs, nice carpet, air conditioning, heat, nice buildings, and on and on and on. And there's really nothing wrong with those things. Having those things are great. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that at all. The problem is when we begin to elevate those as the work of the church above missions. And that's where the problems begin. And, and that is why we've gotten ourselves in such a way. 
So let's now look at Romans and let's, let's become students of the Word and let's become or continue to be, hopefully you already are, continue to be uh, students of Christ and His calling on each of our lives. All right, It's not just, sometimes we, we kind of show up at church and we think, man, I did my thing, I'm here, which actually that is really good that you're here because uh, a lot of people are not, so thank you so much for being here. But that is really the beginning point of our walk with God, being part of the kingdom of God, being part of the family of God. And we now, for many of us, we need to move from that step, the just getting to church step, to the being missional, to living a missional life step. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through Him by faith, and into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions, because we know that affliction produces endurance. See, endurance does not just happen. It is not a physical or emotional or spiritual characteristic that you are just born with. That you just suddenly, it's, it's just kind of like, it seems like sometimes in life, some people can just take more, right? They can just endure more and handle more stress and chaos and, and such. But that, that is not, that is a false assumption. That, that we each individually have to grow to the place where we can handle more in our lives. You know, that's why when you're a teenager, you're, you're a young adult, you're a college student, you just seem like your, wife, your life is overwhelming and you can't handle one more thing. And then, 20 years later, you've piled a, a spouse and children and, and a, a much more stressful job and, and other things in your life and, and you're, you're, you, you, you're amazed at what you can handle. So it's just a, it's an, it is an aspect of reality, it's an aspect of existence and, and of uh, endurance that is produced through this catalyst that we see here of affliction. All right? and, if, and, and if you're wondering, well, oh, that's kind of an unusual word. We don't hear affliction a lot, maybe in literature more, but when you're, you know, you're talking to your neighbor, or you're talking, you, know, you get to work and you're talking to your friends, you don't just kind of start a conversation, well, I feel afflicted in my life right now. So that's probably, so let's, let's examine that word. So to be afflicted, that means that, that something has, has, has produced a, a, a difficulty in your life. You've been afflicted. There's been a catalyst that, is, that has caused some kind of change or trouble or hardship or, or difficulty, and that is affliction, right? It comes upon you. You don't necessarily invite it, although sometimes uh, the choices that we make invite affliction, but it comes upon us and is often unwanted, but that affliction produces endurance, all right? And let's go on. Then it says endurance produces proven character. All right, so character is just the, the things that we are, you know, moody, grumpy, happy, jealous, you know, those are, that's character, okay? But then all of a sudden when we add the word proven, all right, what we're saying is that, that the positive characteristics that we want to have in our life that, that cause us to be productive, that cause us to, to have a servant's heart and to accomplish much in our lives, that happens as a result of learning endurance. So we cannot have the things that we want in ourselves, in our being, in our characteristics. We cannot have those things without affliction and endurance. We just can't do it. And this, and this is the problem. This is why we don't like that character building process. Because we don't want affliction. And we really don't want to go through the process of learning to endure. Um, you've probably have observed the last couple of years I've gotten very interested in homesteading and self-sufficiency and learning to do things the old-fashioned way. And, and one of the things about that pursuit that has, has struck me as particularly intriguing is that the level of endurance that is required to, uh, to acquire those skills. All right. In other words, if you're going to learn to mill your own flour uh, from oats or wheat or some type of barley or grain and then bake with it, there is a learning process that goes with that. And it takes a long time and there's a lot to learn. You know, the same thing with raising chickens and collecting eggs and, and all those things that go with it, figuring out the whole rooster deal and, and trying to keep the raccoons and possums from devouring them. I mean, there is a long process there that is required to learn those skills, especially since they're not, you know, not taught anymore. I mean, who homesteads, really? Not very many people. 
Uh, in fact, before we even get to the homesteading question, I, I can't remember if I mentioned this statistic or not. We talked about this last week at dinner. But 800,000 farmers uh, live in America. That's it, 800,000. And over 300 and I don't know how many million people now uh, inhabit the United, just the, the continental 48 states of the United States. So you have a fraction of 1% that are feeding the other 100%. Okay, that's an amazing thing. And only a fraction of those 800,000 are actually homesteaders. So that's how, how small it is. You know, you may, it's kind of a trend now, and uh, you may walk around and, and talk to people or meet people or see homesteading type things going on. But by and large, that is a Midwest uh, uh, pursuit in, in some other places, you know, in the United States. And to a lot of people, you know, if you were, grew up in Philadelphia or St. Louis or Los Angeles, you, you start talking homesteading, they just think you're absolutely you know out of your mind or Amish or something you know so um, it is important that we recognize that if we're going to learn something important something of value there's going to be a process that is required of us process that is required every every church that starts out they want to go out guns blazing they want to change the world, change their community they want to go from zero to five thousand in one month Everybody wants that. But see, that, that doesn't happen through just going out and doing it. That happens through the affliction that comes by accepting that call and staying the course and, and working through the problems and the hardships and the difficulties and coming out the other side as a church that matters, a church that has meaning, a church that does something, that is known in their community for being missional, for being servants, for making a difference. Let's go on. Proven character then produces hope. And this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us, who is, of course, our power source. So the hope that will not disappoint that suggests to us that there is something that is disappointing. All right? So that begs the question for us as, as readers and as learners and what does that mean then? Exactly. If, if the hope doesn't disappoint, then what does disappoint? And what the, the epistle is alluding to here is that anytime we strive after something in life and we want to take shortcuts or, or we don't want to put in the work that it takes to do it well, we're going to be disappointed. All right? It's just like when you're, here, here's a perfect example of this. This happened to me. It's been a long time, but when, especially when I was younger, I would walk into Lowe's. And I would smell the air. You know the smell. It's the smell of, of home improvement. It's the, oh, that door that needs to be fixed. Oh, that flooring that needs to be placed. Oh, that, you, you know the smell. Everybody's smiling. You know, you know the feeling. And all of a sudden, you get this false sense of, of ability, right? And you're thinking, I am going to walk out of here today with plumbing pipes and electrical fixtures and drywall, and I am going to, to do something dramatic to my house to make it better, right? You've all, we've all been there, we've dumped a, a ton of money, and we got all the stuff home, we have absolutely no idea what we're doing, trying to watch YouTube and call every friend we have that might have some clue what we're doing, and we just make a, a total disaster of the situation, all right? Total disaster. We all know that, well, not all of us, but most of us know that, that feeling or that have had that experience. And where, where probably what should have happened is we should have taken that thought captive and thought to myself, number one, can I afford this improvement? Number two, do I have the skill set to, or can I learn how to do this task? And then, and what people, you know, and, and if the answer is no to those questions, then, you know, how, mu how much money do I need to save? What kind of people do I need to go learn from and take some time? And then when we're ready, we can do the project, right? But that, that rarely happens, right? <laughs> we just get excited and we smell the air and we see the picture, you know, of some amazing, they make it look like when you go in there, they just like some do-it-yourself or just came in and did this, you know, in the picture when like some hardened professional who does it for a living, who gets paid thousands and thousands of dollars to do it, did it. And we're thinking, oh yeah, I can do that, no problem. And the worst then, of course, that to add uh, injury to insult is whenever your spouse comes in after you spent, you know, the whole weekend doing whatever it is you are, destroying the house, and it's like, uh, you should have hired a professional to do that. But I'm sure that's never happened to you guys. It certainly has never happened to me. Well, maybe once or twice. Let's go on then to Romans chapter 12, because we do not want to be disappointed. We want our life to matter. We don't want to live a life 
that is just a big disappointment. I mean, do, do, how, many, how many of you wake up in the morning and you think, man, I just can't wait to be disappointed today. I'm so excited. I'm looking forward to what's going to go wrong. I'm looking forward to those, those unexpected costs to my car that's going to break down or, or to that injury that's going to happen or to that pay cut I'm going to have to have or to that, that problem out, in the out on the farm, you know, that calf that's going to get killed or, or, you know, we don't wake up ex hoping for that. We might expect that if, we're a little, if we've had some negative experience in the past, but that's not what we're hoping for. We're hoping that everything is going to go great today. It's going to be a new day, a fresh start, nothing's going to go wrong, and, and we hope for the good things that life has to offer. Let's look at Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good, what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. All right, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. You cannot have success and peace and joy and happiness in this life unless you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Period. You cannot do that. You cannot skip A, B, C, D, E, F, G and get to Z. It doesn't work. It always ends badly. Maybe not right away, but eventually it will end badly. You have to be transformed. Your mind has to be renewed. It has to be changed, in other words. The things that you believe that have brought you to the place that you're at in your life, those things have to change. And the problems with those things have to be killed off. They have to die. Right? Just like the Beatles that got peaches, most people's peaches this year. I think we got two peaches. I think Paul got zero peaches. Uh, you have to get rid of the beetles. Or they're going to eat your peaches. All right? It's just that simple. And we have those same things that eat uh, up the good stuff in our life. And if we don't eliminate them, then we will have nothing to show for it but disappointment. Now, I think it is interesting here that, it, that the outcome of the renewing of our mind is that we might be able to know what is the will of God. And that's a good thing. I mean, how, how many times have you had a friend or someone that you know that has said to you or that you've said to them, man, I just wish I knew what God wanted me to do in this situation, to know what God's will is for me, whether to do, make this choice or to make this choice. It happens a lot, maybe weekly, maybe daily, maybe at least monthly, that we're wondering, well, what does God want me to do? What would be the right choice here? But we can't know that unless our mind has been transformed unless our mind has been changed. Let's look at a story. This is a great story. It's also a terrible story. It deals with the issue of cost, which if the first part of that last section, it talks about being a living sacrifice. All right, another, I mean, a sacrifice is something that's killed. Okay, so let's just get that out of the way. When you make a sacrifice, you alter a sacrifice, you're killing something, you know, an animal or whatever. You know, a habit, a bad habit in your life. If you sacrifice it, you're giving it up. And so we are to be sacrifices. We are to give up what the world wants us to do and what the, what the sin nature wants us to do. We're giving that up. We're exchanging that. We're killing that. And we are becoming who God wants us to be. And the, the, the challenge of getting from point A to point B is that there is a cost. That sacrifice costs something. And we'll read about the cost in this story. It's Matthew 19, verses 16 through 26. It is the story of the rich young ruler. Just then someone came up and asked him, Teacher, talking to Jesus, what good must I do to have eternal life? Simple question. To have eternal life, to live forever, that when we die, to go and be with Jesus, what must I do? Simple answer. Why do you ask me about what is good? And he said to them, There is only one who is good. And if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He asked him. And Jesus answered, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, that means lie, honor your father and your mother, love your neighbor as yourself. And the rich young ruler replied happily, I have kept all of these things. The young man told him, What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, Then go and sell your belongings and give them to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard that command, okay, so it wasn't a suggestion, it was this is what you've got to do. Because Jesus knows the heart of every man and he knew that the one thing that he could not give up, the one thing that he could not sacrifice was his wealth. And when he heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. And then Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, I assure you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished and they asked, Then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and he said, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And he was foreshadowing his own death and resurrection at that moment. He was saying, we can't, You cannot do it alone but I am I'm here to provide a way for you to do it. When we are forced into, or when we elect to enter these times of endurance, these times of change, and I, I want to talk specifically, not about our, our church right now, in the season that we're in, but I want to talk specifically about your individual life. That when you are in that time, and it seems to me, and my experience has been, that I am in those times more than I am not. And maybe that's an election, and maybe that is God's plan. For me, I cannot say. But it seems that those times come, those times of challenge and difficulty come more frequently than the times of you know, bliss and relaxation and peace. And when I come to those times, I begin my, my natural response, the response that is to be sacrificed, is to worry. To begin to, to ponder on all the things in my life that I cannot control. The things that are outside of my control and I begin to worry. You know, will my wife be safe? Will my children be safe? Will I have enough money? Will I uh, make the right decisions in my job? Will I, you know, on and on and on and on. And we begin to worry and we begin to wonder and we begin to, to become upset by the things that are outside of our control. Now I make a distinction there because... We should be concerned with the things that are in our control, right? We shouldn't just be like, okay, God, I'm just going to lay here on the couch today, and I just want you to fix everything in my life. <laughs> See, that always ends, okay, even my children know, that ends badly. Of course, for them it ends badly because we're, we're going to cause them to rise from the couch and get back to work. But for, me, for many of us, you know, we, we recognize that if we do that, Eventually, we're going to be evicted from that, from said couch, and we're going to be on the street. All right? And the Bible even says, if a man won't work, neither shall he eat. So it, it's not a complicated thing. So there's a distinction there. We should not worry about the things within our control, but we should do something about them. We should face those challenges. We should be proactive. We should react appropriately. We should be facing those challenges and doing our best. And you know what? Sometimes at the end of the day, it's not enough. In fact, many times at the end of the day, when we do our very best, we are not able to accomplish our goals. And that's okay. We have to leave it there. And we have to go into that place where we recognize that beyond that point, beyond our best, it is out of our control. All right? And this next passage is dealing with that. It's in Philippians 4, another epistle, another great New Testament epistle. Philippians 4 4 through 8. And I would say that probably if there were a top 10 most prominent New Testament passages, this would be one of those. And you know why that is? That's because we're a bunch of worriers. <laughs> because we're constantly stressed out and worried about things. And that started, I'm going to say, during the Industrial Revolution in America and has continued to get progressively worse until this very day, where it is worsening and worsening and worsening. The pace of life when I was a kid, which of course I'm not talking about just being a kid because that pace of life is always slower than when you're an adult. But the pace of life generally in America in the 19, early 1980s was very, very different than it is today. The expectations of what you should have and what you should do and how many, how many hours you should work was much, much less than it is now. And so the, the problem of worry has only been amplified. Because there is more and more things to acquire, more and more to do, more and more hours to work, and because per capita of what we earn, our standard of living is much lower than it was, even 20 years ago. And so it requires us to work longer and harder to have the same standard of life. 
But God says and teaches us this very important thing through this passage that we are not to worry. That we are not to be plagued and, and to be concerned with the things that are outside of our control. Let's read this together, beginning in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone, for the Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And let's pause there for a moment before we go on. So there is a strategy here. There is a specific uh, methodology and pattern of how we are to respond to those feelings of worry, okay, those emotions of worry that comes from our minds. And here it is, step one, be glad, rejoice. It's a choice. We choose that. And that, and that is hard to recognize because the world says that, that whatever our circumstances are, whatever happens to us, then, then our reaction to that is either sorrow or joy. Okay, and it's more complicated. I realize there's jealousy and anger and all these other things. But generally, it's either a positive or a negative reaction. That's what the world says. But God says that how we respond, that who we are, our state of mind, our feelings, that is a choice. That is what we choose. And that's hard. Because that means we have to sacrifice, we have to kill off what the world says, what our sin nature says, what, our, what our, our true sinful nature says. And we have to embrace how God made us, who is our creator, who designed us. He knows how we ought to work when we're not broken. And that is to rejoice. So that is first the choice, that we will be joyful regardless of those circumstances. And to let our graciousness, in other words, our humility, to let our spirit, who we are, be made known, that we might be purveyors of peace rather than purveyors of worry-wartedness. And then next it says, very clearly, do not worry about anything. All right? Not how much money you're going to make, not where your next meal is going to come from, not what on and on and on, all the list of things in your mind, All right, which most of us are not as worried about where our next meal is going to come from. All right? We're a lot more superficial. We're worrying about how our nails look and how our hairs look and how our hair looks. And because I guess hair is plural for, yeah, there's no such thing as hairs. And, uh, you know, the list goes on. All these things, you know, how fat we are or thin we are or old or young we look. I mean, and the list goes on and on. We're worried about all these really, truly ridiculous things. And I'm not just saying that because I'm getting old and fat. I'm just saying it because it is actually a little bit ridiculous. Well, a lot ridiculous. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate that. There'll be a $20 bill uh, for you uh, later on for that. Now all the kids are going to be like, oh, Dad, you look so great today. Your hair looks so nice. Yeah. And the peace of God. Okay, so here's the result then. All right. When we, when we come then, and I guess I don't want to skip a step. We've got to take it to the Lord and we say, God, this is what I need. Then, our, then our, the result of that, our reaction to that, is that the peace of God, all right? And when, when it says which surpasses every thought or which traverses understanding or you know, whatever your translation says, what that basically means is it is bedazzling, okay? It is, it is mind-blowing. It, it is not understandable. It is not, not fathomable by us mere mortals, all right? We cannot truly understand how it works, okay? End of, end of, uh, of sentence there. But that peace, which doesn't seem to make sense, which we cannot understand, it will guard, all right? In other words, it will set itself up in our hearts and minds, all right? And so, in other words, in, in our thinking and in, in, in our reactions and in our life, and we will be with Christ in that, that He will be with us. He will bear those burdens with us. He will stand in the gap with us. He will endure those hardships with us. And that truly is what separates us from the world. And that we are people of peace if we're really following Christ, if we've really given up as a sacrifice those worries to Him, then we can walk around in peace, not worrying about all these things that we cannot control. I mean, good grief, the, the election that's coming up, the state of the economy, the state of all the wars and things that seem to be kind of halfway going on or maybe going to start and blow up and get crazy. I mean, man... If, if, if you let go down that path of worry, you will be either in the insane asylum, the mental hospital, in counseling every day, all day, or I don't know, it's getting bad. You know, we cannot go down that path or, or we will be annihilated truly in our minds. It, it is a path that leads to insanity because there are so many troubles that are outside of our control. In verse 8 it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true... 
whatever is honorable, whatever is just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there is any moral excellence, and if there is any praise, okay, which there is, all right, dwell on these things. In other words, think on them. Embrace them. Bring them into your life. You know, why, why has the church historically been so against certain things? You know, like gambling, drinking, drugs, you know, on and on and on. Why is the church so against those things? Because they don't fall into the category of things that are honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. We don't abstain to these things because we're a big, mean people and God's a big, mean God and we just have a bunch of rules and we're a bunch of tight butts. It's because we know that peace and joy in life comes from getting rid of those things, from dwelling on things that are good, that are pure, that are wholesome. I mean, our, our world, our young people are wrecked on an ocean of immorality. It, it is absolutely the most immoral and pagan culture that, that this continent has seen for maybe forever. Maybe forever. And in fact, ultimately, I think if, if a historian someday can, can separate himself out of our time and, and look back on this culture, I don't know that they would see a vast difference between the ancient Romans and the pre-Christian Romans and America in the 21st century. All of the things that we were raised to understand were wrong are now somehow right. And if you even mention that that might be wrong, somehow you're wrong and evil and a hater and all this other stuff. And it is absolutely ridiculous. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. And that ends that section in Philippians. So we understand today that we have a choice. We understand personally and as a church, but in every way, that we have a choice that will determine whether we live a life of disappointment or whether we live a life of peace. No one can make that decision for us. There is no shortcuts. There, there is only that process of affliction and endurance that produces good character, that produces hope. You cannot skip any of those steps. You probably have, have, would agree or realize that in, in grief, um, there are, or when you've experienced some kind of severe trauma, there are these, na these steps of, of recovery. You know, the, the first one is denial, where you kind of deny the, the tragedy or the problem that happened. The second one is anger. You know, you get mad and, and start throwing stuff or, you know, killing people or however you react to that. And then, then after that, you have uh, this sadness. You know, you, you, you realize all oh, this did happen. You stop being angry. You're sad. You begin to <coughs> live in the reality of that loss. And then finally, acceptance. You accept that. It's a natural process, and we would probably all agree that, yes, that's a natural process that we all go through, that when we experience a loss, that's a natural process. And, and what I am suggesting to you today and submitting to you today is that God has the same process in, in a life of prosperity, in a life of peace and goodness that we must go through. And I want to encourage you today, if you are in a time of affliction, then, then God is working that out. He is working out peace and joy in your life right now that you are in the midst of that process. Because see, if we're in denial, that first phase of the grief process, if we're in denial of it, we can't move on to anything. We can't deal with it. It's just like, you know, if you have a small water leak in your house and you kind of ignore that and deny that it's there, it's going to cause a really big problem pretty soon. It's going to rot your floor out and it's going to start making a really bad smell and it's going to start just destroying things slowly in your life. And it's the same way that worry is. It's the same way that, 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 that trying to somehow skirt or skip or cheat this process that you're going to end up with a, with a lot of rot and a lot of disgusting problems in your life. God has offered a better way for us and I invite you to embrace that path if you've been avoiding it today. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful that you have a plan, that you have a design, that we're not just kind of out here at random just trying to figure out how to survive, that you understand the, what's at stake, you understand the problems, you, you care, 
that you have invited us to come and to, to lay at your feet all of the difficulties and hardships that we have to endure in life. And that in exchange for that sacrifice, you have given us peace, freedom from worry, hope, and joy. And today, Lord, I pray for, for each of us, brothers and sisters, that have come here to worship today, that have made it a priority to be in, in your house, to be in your place, to hear from you, to, to be encouraged and to, to bring encouragement to the church. I pray, Lord, that it, for, for those of us that are struggling with worry, we're struggling with doubt, we're struggling with, in the midst of, endur and of enduring hardship, I pray that you would bring us a fresh wind of encouragement. I pray that you would bring us the this, this solidity of these truths, that we no longer would be tossed around by the hardships and the uncertainties of life, but that we would stand rock steady on the promises of your word. And may your spirit be with us and go with us and give us boldness to proclaim the truth of the gospel in our lives as we go from this place today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.